Well, isn't that a perfect segue to address, of course, sometimes an elephant in the room in regards to the topic, but I'll tell you, the agent of persecution that causes all of these Christians around the world to put their life on the line is from the government. It only comes from government, which becomes, apart from God, the number one opposition to the people of God. I'm gonna share my heart this morning out of Romans chapter 13, which is where we'll be, and the reason that is the account we're looking at is because it is the most misinterpreted passage in reference to government. We have to have a proper or a working knowledge of the book, of the word of God as Christians. Now obviously this Tuesday would be an election day and I believe for too long the church and the Christian has sat on the sidelines and allowed lies to thrive in the public square, which is where God wanted the Christian to shine the light, not only the light of truth, which would point people to the salvation of the soul, which is the gospel, but the implications of the gospel, which impact individuals, my life and your life, and how we should lead lives of righteousness that point to our God, who is a God of law and order. Now, the questions that need to be answered are, what government is right? What type of government does God espouse? What is the right form of government as God would have it? And in the midst of that question, how about this one? What is the role of the Christian in response to any form of government? So I wanna start with the worst form of government, that is an autocracy. Some would call it a tyranny. Now, when you consider from the Old Testament to the New Testament, there's no contradiction in what God is asking his people to understand, to know, to live, and to be about. There's no contradiction. So from the Jews in ancient Israel to the Christians in the New Testament, you're gonna see there's a similar response to those that claim the name of God. In Jeremiah chapter 29, verse seven, one verse tells us that when the Jews were brought into Babylon, into captivity for judgment, they were under a government that was tyrannical, that was headed up by a monarchy, a monarchy with no checks and balances. His name was Nebuchadnezzar. And Jeremiah writes a letter and one verse tells the people in the midst of that government how to respond, how to live. Here it is, Jeremiah 29, seven, and seek the peace of the city where I've caused you to be carried away captives. Now seek the peace of the city, underscore that, and pray to the Lord for it. It's kind of what we just did by praying for the Christians around the world. We're praying for the Lord that peace would reign and that they would share gospel truth. For in its peace, you will have peace. In the peace of a city or a community, another word in certain translations is, is the welfare of a city. Seek the welfare of the community where God has called you to be carried away or where God has placed you for such a time as this, where God has placed you in today's day and age is no accident. In fact, it's by appointment. You are living during these days because God wants to use you with what he's given you as a gift that's steward, that we steward for his glory. Now, what does that look like in the grand scheme of a body? This is not a social club, right? It's not coming together on a Sunday, chanting some songs, hearing a good talk and then leaving and being unpersuaded by the truths therein. They're told to seek the welfare of the community where they are and pray to the Lord for it. Because if the community flourishes, if there's peace in our communities, there'll be peace in your heart and your soul. So to answer a question, what type of government does God require? I would say the choice government of God 
is when God is the choice of government. That's not just a play on words. The choice government of God is for his people to choose him as their government, that God would govern us in the midst of any context. God's governance or administration or his laws, his orders, his principles, his values would actually lead my individual life and lead my family's life and even would be the pillars that uphold my communal life. In Isaiah verse 22 of chapter 33, we get a description of God, the makeup of God, the jurisdiction of God, the administration of God himself. Look at this verse. For the Lord is our judge. The Lord is our lawgiver. The Lord is our king. He will save us. It's interesting, those three categories. God applies to himself. Judge, lawgiver, and king. Right, that would be a perfect theocracy. It's what God intended for his people, Israel, in the Old Testament. And they looked out at the land and the nations around them and said, we want a king like the other nations. And Samuel was so grieved, do you remember this? And God said, no, 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 no. They've not rejected you as the prophet. They've rejected me, God said. I was to be their king. I was to be their lawgiver. I was to be their judge. So God gave them Saul. After Saul was David, after David was Solomon, and the kingdom split from there. And there were kings that served the Lord, and there were kings that did disservice to the Lord. Judge, lawgiver, king. Well, it's interesting that those become the very three branches of our government in these United States of America. And when asked of people today, what are the three branches of our government? You would be shocked to know that not a lot of people can even answer the most basic question about our constitutional republic. So we start there. Like Isaiah 33, 22, we have a judicial branch. We have a legislative branch, lawmakers. We have an executive branch, which is made up of our president and his administration and cabinet. We have the judicial branch that is the ones that make sure the law is upheld in the land. They balance out the scales of justice. The lawmakers, of course, and I've said this before, all of which are byproducts of the Ten Commandments. Every single law in our law books is basically a byproduct of our Ten Commandments. How to conduct one's life in relation to God and others. Why did they design it this way? From its inception, it was the separation of power. They understood the evil of man's heart. That man's heart needed to be governed, needed to be checked by a higher authority so the separation of power was to prevent the corruption of power and evil. When you understand your history, the three branches that we have are offshoots off of the trunk of truth, the Bible. The Bible and the truths therein is where we get moral law. Moral law comes through and frames the infrastructure of civil law. You cannot have a civil law without a moral law. To which George Washington said, it is impossible to rightly govern a nation without God and the Bible. Amen. That was our first commander in chief who loved the Lord. Now when he said that, and of course all these years later, you can almost take out the phrase a nation and put whatever you want there. It is impossible to rightly govern a life without God and the Bible. It is impossible to rightly govern a family without God and the Bible. It is impossible to rightly govern a church without God and the Bible. It is impossible to rightly govern a marriage without God and the Bible. Amen. 
And if it's not the Bible, if we are not being rightly governed by the Bible, we are being wrongly governed by Babel. And too many Christians have accepted the laws and the order of Babel to look at what is called the forefathers, the framers. Many of their quotes tell us of a narrative that secular historians and revisionists don't want the church to know. John Adams said, our constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. But think about that, if you will. Our governing framework, which is the constitution in our land, is only applicable, it only works when it's a religious and moral people who are supporting it. Because we the people in the Declaration of Independence were majority believers. And they looked at their land, yeah, maybe as an experiment, as some have said, but many of them looked at it as a divine appointment. And it was a new start to be lights and shine the light of the gospel upon a world that was being tyrannically oppressed. When we divorce moral rule from civil rule, what you get is arbitrary rule, okay? Autonomous rule. That is always the case before tyrannical rule. The reason why we should care about this is because the Bible is actually telling us and taking us on a journey of a trajectory that is eventually leading to a tyrannical rule that is gonna be governed and superheaded by a man named the Antichrist. And I don't know about you, but I don't wanna be a part of a, a process that allows that to happen faster than it should because as long as I'm here and the Holy Spirit lives inside of me and his body, then I should be a restrainer of sorts, delaying the decay of the day so that no matter where I'm placed, in the public sector or private sector, I'm allowing God's truth to reign. And if God's truth doesn't reign, as said this past Thursday, when truth dies, it's because lies thrive. And when lies thrive, people die. To which Patrick Henry said, is when a people forget God, that tyrants forge their chains. True. Tyrants rise through the vein of lies. And one of those lies that has allowed tyrants to rise is the lie of separation of church and state. And no, Romans 13 is not a command to submit to any form of government. And that's why we chose Romans 13. Many believers believe this because of what I call faulty exegesis. Taking it and not understanding, one, the context by which it was written, and two, the context by which you're living. Romans 13, misapplied, creates the stream which allows tyrants to rise. You know, when Hitler became the chancellor of Germany in 1933, he propagated a platform that was about national socialism. It's where we get the word Nazi from, national socialists. And early on, he brokered relationships with the church at large. But within that first year, certain spiritual leaders began to sense and see ahead of their times, something was lurking beneath the surface. The way Hitler was framing with religious language what he was going to do on behalf of the German people. While not disassociating himself from the church, but making sure that the church knew her place in relation to state. Two men that are most known during that time period are Pastor Martin Niemöller and Dietrich Bonhoeffer. There were pastors that gathered as they should have with great concern about the heartbeat of their land and their people, and Hitler found out. Within that first year, January of 1934, 
Hitler invited select spiritual leaders to his office, where he began by stating peace between church and state. And then he proceeded to explain to them he felt undermined as their leader when he began explaining what he thought the role of the church should be, Martin Niemöller spoke up. He said, our role in the community is to protect the welfare of the church, the state, and the people. Hitler replied, you confine yourself to the church. I'll take care of the German people. He continued about his programs and his ideas of having peace with the church at the very end of the meeting, before they exited, Martin Niemöller stopped and he said, you said you'll take care of the German people, but we too, as Christians and churchmen, have a responsibility to the German people. God has entrusted that stewardship to us and there's not a person or a system in the world that can stop us from caring for the state. Hitler didn't say a word. It wasn't long after that where Niemöller and Bonhoeffer's quarters were ransacked. There were threats against their life. But what Hitler set out to do using government and state was he began to legislate and put on the books policies that would cause the church and the Christian to question their allegiance where you wouldn't be able to speak out against the state or government without being persecuted. In fact, they had a law that stated there would be abuse from the pulpit if you mentioned anything or created any unrest in the people's heart against their leader, Hail Hitler. Soon in the pulpits in Germany, 1934, 1935, 1936, 1937, closing in on 1940, World War I would, or World War II would break out globally. Some of the massacres or genocides that we read about on the history books would not take place until 1941, eight years after Hitler took power, where the people were subjected to his tyranny, but they didn't see it coming because they were told, if you're part of the church, you need to stay in your lane. And Romans 13 was the passage that many pastors in the pulpit would use to submit their congregants to the rule of Hitler. Don't ask any questions. So Romans 13 is where we'll be. Let's see what it has to say for the Christian in the church of today. Romans 13, verse one, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities for there is no authority except from God and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Pretty straightforward here. This would be, if you're taking notes, this is a description, a perfect description of government, describing the role and the right of government. Let every soul, that's you and I, be subject, that's a military term, fall in line, with the governing authorities, for there is no authority, this is simple theology, no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist already appointed by God, from God, by God. Every one of us should submit to the governing authorities. Mind you, when Paul wrote this, the governing authority was Nero, Emperor Nero. It was an autocracy, They didn't have election cycles. There was no voting every two years to change your candidate. They had no choice but to submit. Paul was referencing a murmuring or a spirit that was moving throughout the early church that he wanted to put in check under the authority of God. And that spirit came from a political party known as the Zealots. And the zealots believed if we're bringing God's kingdom here on earth, then we should overthrow man's government. And there was this idea that they were gonna overthrow government. Simon the zealot, who was a disciple of Jesus, had that same spirit. And Jesus had to put that in check. 
They thought Jesus was gonna come as a messianic warrior to overthrow the Roman oppression. This was the governmental structure when Paul was writing this letter and he's actually putting to rest the idea that Christians do not participate in insurrection. We submit. This is a description of government. Peter would write the same thing in a separate letter, 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. Therefore, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man, key phrase, for the Lord's sake, whether to the king is supreme, Nero, or to governors like Pontius Pilate. That was the governmental structure. A governor was appointed in a municipality or a province. He was a proxy, so to speak, of the Caesar or emperor, but the emperor was supreme. That was the supreme law of their land. A Caesar, hail Caesar. Caesar was God. Governors were proxies of that law and order. Peter helps us understand Romans 13 verse one. The description of government is that God is the ultimate authority and he appoints delegates, all right? If we're all on the same page here, right away, we submit to every form of government, tyrannical like Nero or a constitutional republic like these United States of America. We submit to the governing authorities. Well, here's the nuance. The governing authorities in our land are the people. Now we run into a problem. What Paul is saying in a context with a autocracy is completely entirely different than how a believer should respond in the midst of a constitutional republic, which is the supreme law of our land, not a person. And if you don't even know what the constitutional republic means or says, then how can you submit to the governing authorities? In fact, by not casting a vote on Tuesday, you're actually contradicting what Romans 13 is telling you to do. Because a form of submitting to the governing authorities is engaging in that process. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. All right, we're going somewhere with this. Because as a footnote, Paul himself would be killed by the very government that he's writing about for not submitting to its authorities. Hmm. We run into another problem. The writer, his life is actually seemingly contradicting the very verses that he penned to the church because he lives a life that runs into the government more than any other New Testament writer. And it would be the very government that would take his head off for not submitting to the government. So there's this loophole here. What is Paul saying? As already referenced, he's addressing those who believed that they should overthrow the establishment by physical force, like the zealots. They believed biblically, Deuteronomy 17, verse 15, which said the people of God, Israel, they should not have any king over them except for one from their own country. If a foreigner was king, it was an indication that God was not with them. So they wanted to move to remove any foreigner as king over them so that Deuteronomy 17 verse 15 would bring the blessing back to their land. So they used the Bible, but they didn't understand that they were misapplying it just as many believers in the New Testament context use Romans 13 and they don't understand they're actually misapplying it. So what are we submitting to then? Here's the question, Christian. Let's go back to the passage in Peter. He helps us here. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether to the king is supreme or to governors. Here it is. As to those who are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do good. What are we submitting to? King supreme, constitution supreme, governors, elected officials, whose role is to Punish evildoers, honor and praise those who do good. There it is. Punish lawbreakers. 
honor and praise anyone who would be considered an upstanding citizen. And by the way, Noah Webster said, good Christians make good citizens, period. Now, you might have seen the videos. You may have seen the press conferences. You may have even seen some of our military men and women being invited to the White House as high-ranking generals and the president himself. By the way, the military's commander-in-chief honors these servicemen and women for an act of valor and courage, something they did to advance the liberty and freedom and sanctification and protection of their own country on a foreign land or even a domestic experience, and they honor them. The government actually honors and praises those who have done good. I just watched a man being interviewed by the mayor of a city because he saw a little girl about to be grabbed by an assailant, and he stopped the assailant from kidnapping this little girl, and it became national news and there they were, the government, honoring this man, praising him for doing good. You might have seen people who have put their life at risk on a train, running into a burning building, and government finds a way to honor those people. It's what Peter says they should do. They punish evildoers, and they honor and praise those who do good. Now, what you're about to see in a video at the highest level and office of our land and the person who's in the video is not there for any of the aforementioned things I just said. Being honored by the White House, not for courage, not for an act of valor, not for a public service, Watch, this is what they're there for. Uh, we're gonna move on now to trans rights. There have been many anti-LGBTQ plus bills introduced and enacted, outlawing things like gender affirming healthcare and banning kids from playing sports. To go deeper into this issue, here with us today is Dylan Mulvaney, who's welcomed us into her life by you know, showing on social media her girlhood series. Let's take a look. My name is Dylan Mulvaney, I am a trans woman, and I am documenting my transition publicly on TikTok for the world to see. When people started watching and the numbers kept getting higher, I realized quickly how public my transition would be. Of course I knew that there would be backlash and negativity. I try to not let the internet's words hurt me or my spirit, but do you know what does hurt? Seeing people in power and authority figures creating laws and bills that are actively trying to harm us trans humans, especially trans children. Our lives have become political talking points. Lawmakers in many states want to exclude us from participating in sports or getting proper health care. Some folks want to decide where we can use the bathroom. No one should have fear of living in a state that they call home while being true to themselves. No one should have their lives put in danger because of who they are inside. That's why I'm sharing my story with the world. I'm using my platform to stand up for my community and for any of the little Dylans that deserve a clear path to their true identity. Uh, Mr. President, this is my 221st day of publicly transitioning. God and, love you. Uh, thank you. I am extremely privileged to live in a state that allows me access to the resources I need, and that decision is just between me and my doctors. But many states have lawmakers that feel like they can involve themselves in this very personal process. Do you think states should have a right to ban gender-affirming health care? I don't think any state or anybody should have the right to do that as a moral question and as a legal question. I just think it's wrong. So, several things. First and foremost, gender-affirming gender healthcare is speaking of gender reassignment surgeries, right? It's speaking of a genital castration, a mutilation of the body in the name of public health. I don't show a video like that to incite any disdain in your hearts. In fact, it should be the opposite that occurs. It should be pain and sorrow for people who are confused 
and lost without the gospel of Jesus Christ and the healing power of the cross. But I show you that because I can maybe see something that a lot of people can't. And it's when that type of behavior and belief gets honored by the state, what follows that is legislation. And when they begin to ban speech that would identify a transgender person as being confused and not honoring their biological identity, that could be coined as hate speech. And the moment that happens, and it's happening, is when the church and the Christian and the pulpit won't even be able to preach the gospel because in order to preach the gospel, you have to be able to call out what's sinful. But when something that is sinful is now lawful, I can't even address it unless it becomes criminal. Just as Hitler did in Nazi Germany, it was speech that was the first pillar to go. And what the pulpit was speaking about was censored. Not to mention that our children are the very target of this agenda. The next generation is gonna be subject to curriculums and policies that are going after what we call the Imago Dei. Verse three and four in Romans, back to the context, actually tells us exactly what government is supposed to do. We move from the description, ready, here it is, to the prescription. And these two never contradict. The description, God is the authority behind all government, local, state, and national, no matter who they are. You don't have to agree with their politics. You don't have to agree with their scandals, but God is the authority behind them. He's allowed them to be placed there, okay? But there's a prescription in verses three and four. Here's what they are to do when they are there. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you wanna be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. Are you seeing this? If you don't wanna have any fear of the authorities, then just be a good citizen and do what is good as God defines it. But there's a reason why government is in place on every level. It's when you were coming across the bridge right here and you were going by that rest stop area on the bridge and you saw a certain car that represents the city of Ocean City and it's a police officer and you immediately pumped your brakes. And then you looked at your speedometer. Why did you do that? Because that's a healthy fear of your governing authorities. That is the right response to be a law-abiding citizen. We understand that with traffic laws. Government's role, verse four, is God's deacon, minister to you for good. God's deacon to serve you. But if you do evil, as God defines it, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. This is capital punishment, to be honest with you. For he is God's deacon, minister, servant, an avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Remember, at the end of Romans 12, it speaks about God being the one that avenges. Man does not carry out his own vengeance. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. And then you enter into Romans 13, and Paul is writing the right context of government. It's description, God's behind it, and it's prescription. They are there to honor good and to punish evil, or said this way, restrain evil in the world and sustain good. Civil government is divinely designed to restrain, punish evil, sustain, honor good. And that is why the church is the conscience of a nation. The church is the voice of a standard we are the ones that say, no, that's actually moving from good as God defined it to evil as God defined it. It's actually Isaiah 520. Now here's the question, what happens when that occurs? What happens when we begin to see good as evil and evil as good? When Romans 13 and 1 Peter 2 says that government should see good as good and evil as evil and honor good and restrain evil. Well, we run into a problem. We run into a problem that exists in marriages. When a husband, the appointment of God, divinely designed to be the head of a home, he leads his wife, but when he's not submitted to the authority behind him and he, in fact, he neglects his children or he abuses his wife, he actually forfeits his divorce 
divine appointment. God does not put his hand of blessing upon a husband who doesn't submit to the government of that marriage. And yet we move into the context of the government itself. We go, oh, we can't talk about that. Submit, man, no matter who's in power. I'm going, no, the moment they start elevating evil and the moment they start criminalizing good is the moment the pulpit and the church needs to address it. See, a governing authority forfeits their divine appointment when their policies contradict the divine design of government. When you begin to see institutions no longer honoring good and punishing evil, but actually punishing good and honoring evil, you are seeing something inversed that actually welcomes a curse from the diabolical policies of a schoolhouse to the tyrannical politics of the White House, Isaiah 50, 20, woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Now, this is what I call the reverse psychology of the enemy. If you've ever deployed reverse psychology, you know what it is, right? You're actually advocating for or telling somebody something that you want them to actually do, it might even be the opposite of what you said. So what the government is doing with reverse psychology inspired by the enemy is advocating for love. It's all about love, man, let love be love. It's about human rights. It's about choice. Women should have a choice. It's about tolerance. It's about diversity, can't you see it? It's the opposite of all those things is what they're actually propagating. So here's the question, and it's not a trick question. Should the believer in Christ submit to something that God calls a woe? It rhymes with woe, by the way. <laughs> no. We are called to be obedient to truth, not compliant to lies. Another governing structure in the midst of Jesus' day was the Sanhedrin. Interestingly, Rome gave them authority even to carry out capital punishment. They partnered when they executed Jesus. Remember, they brought Jesus to the state and Pontius Pilate, proxy of Caesar, to perhaps put down unrest, allowed the people to vote for Barabbas or Jesus. And I'll give you what you choose. And the people wanted Barabbas. And the innocent one is the one that we hung. And we know that's the gospel. Thank you, Jesus, for taking my place. I'm Barabbas. And I go on my way, set free from something that I did and he died for. But in Acts chapter four, early on, as the church is filled by the Holy Spirit, you have this occurring. They heal a man outside of the temple. They get punished for it. They're brought before the authorities. They called them and commanded them, Peter and John, not to speak at all, speech, nor teach, explain, expound, in the name of Jesus. Don't do anything in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than God, you judge. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. And guess where that lived for them? What they saw and what they heard. It lived in their conscience, okay? Because as we make our way through Romans 13, we bump into verse five. Therefore, you must be subject not only because of wrath, you can be punished if you break the law, but also for conscience sake. Con science, with knowledge. With what knowledge? With moral knowledge, with spiritual knowledge, with the knowledge of truth, the knowledge of the Bible, the knowledge of the word of God, the knowledge of the gospel, the implications of the gospel, the governance of righteousness. Having that knowledge live in your conscience where God speaks when my conscience is tethered to or held captive by the voice of God, I can do nothing but see the things God wants me to see and speak the things God wants me to speak. And when the state says I can't speak what God told me to speak, I have a decision to make.
Christians for too long have justified their silence. That faith is supposed to be kept private. Keep your faith private, right? It's a Sunday thing. The other argument as of late has been, hey, faith has been politicized. You can't touch on certain things because you know what? It's entered the political domain. Well, here's the reality. Faith that is privatized and faith that is politicized is faith that is neutralized. It's exactly what Hitler wanted of the church. Separation of church and state, stay in your lane. That eventually led to submission of church to state. And then when they started to push back, suppression of church by state. But faith, huh, faith in Christ is not a private preference. It is a public preservation. My faith in Christ leads me to be salt, which preserves values and truth even in a world that is fighting against it. Faith is a public good for God. Let your light so shine before who? The public that they may see your good works, which you do in the name of God, so that they can glorify your Father who is in heaven. Because there are people who need to see the courage of the Christian in order to say, what they say they believe they're living is real. I want what they have. But if we're gathering on a Sunday, and this is our spiritual huddle, and we don't live for the Lord outside of these walls, the world is not gonna see that we're different. So what makes us different than the world is that we have a hope and a truth that governs our lives. So what does it look like to obey the conscience? When it became clear that the Nazis were pursuing their terrible racist policies, back to Pastor Martin Niemöller, him and Bonhoeffer kept preaching truth. They kept charging the church to rise up, don't be silenced. As a result, Niemöller was thrown in prison, one of the concentration camps. A prison chaplain actually came to visit Niemöller and asked him somewhat foolishly, what brings you here? Why are you in prison? To which Niemöller angrily replied, and brother, why aren't you in prison? <laughs> you know why that brother wasn't in prison? Though he wore the cloth, he was given to Caesar what was God's. And he was attempting to give to God what was Caesar's. That'll make sense in a second. Verse six and seven. Because of this, you pay taxes, for they are God's ministers attending continually to this very thing. Render, therefore, to all their due. Taxes to whom taxes are due. Custom to whom customs. Fear to whom fear. Honor to whom honor. This is basically Paul's commentary on what Jesus said in Matthew 22 about rendering to God's what is God's and giving to Caesar's what is Caesar. The two main themes that Paul is addressing is insurrection. Christians do not overthrow any government by force. And as an aside, the American Revolution was not a violation of Romans 13 as people will argue. And here's why. King George and the governmental structure of Great Britain was left intact. There was no insurrection. There was no overthrowing. There was a separation as listed in the Declaration of Independence. So when people say our own country started off in sin, you say to them, what insurrection? King George still sat on his throne. His government still tyrannically ruled we just decided to separate, and that is where God put his hand of grace and providence upon these United States. So what Paul is saying is you render to Caesar what is Caesar's. That's taxes. And their tax scale were worse than our tax scale. Their tolls and customs, that's the word customs here. This, this word custom here does not mean like the customs of culture. This means the toll that you drove through on the parkway before you got off the exit, you have to pay to get to the next area of the state. That's what they're talking about here. So Christians follow tax law, Christians follow traffic law, and Christians without question follow tort law. Let me define tort law for you. Tort is wrongful act that injures or interferes with an individual's person or property. Tort law is the, the golden rule. Don't hurt anyone. Treat people the way you wanna be treated. Give to the state traffic law, tax law, and tort law. Be good citizens. 
But what happens when truth law comes under attack? This is what Jesus meant as we close. Matthew chapter 22, verses 15 to 22. Then the Pharisees went and plotted how they might entangle him in his talk. This is Jesus. And they sent to him their disciples with the Herodians, two political parties. Okay, the Pharisees and the Herodians were enemies, but now they are allies against Jesus. And when they come to Jesus, here's their question. Teacher, we know that you are true and teach the way of God in truth, nor do you care about anyone for you do not regard the person of men. Tell us therefore, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, why do you test me, you hypocrites? Show me the tax money. So they brought him a denarius and he said to them, whose image and inscription is this? And they said to him, Caesar's. And he said to them, render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. Render therefore to God the things that are God's. Question, what is God's? Not only everything, a specific thing. If that coin was the mint of Rome and had the image of Caesar on it, Question, who has the image of God on it? You do. Humans have the image of God. We are imprinted from the mint of heaven that all man is created in the image of God, created equal and has been endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. And those rights include the life and the liberty and the pursuit of property. Charles Colson said, democracy is not prescribed in the Bible. Christians can and do live under other political systems, but Christians can hardly fail to love democracy because of all systems, it best assures human dignity, the essence of our creation in God's image. What happens when the image of God in man and in children in the womb goes under attack? You render to God's what is God's? Charles Colson also said, a government cannot be truly just without affirming the intrinsic value of human life. Let that soak in. Romans 13, properly applied, honoring good, punishing evil, cannot be just as the way of justice should be defined unless human life is valued. When human life is no longer valued is when the church goes from obeying the state to disobeying the state because the obedience to God and life as he described it and prescribed it is coming under attack. That's why Jesus said, as he's about to depart, he tells his disciples what we call the Great Commission, which every Christian should go on mission under the authority of the Great Commission. And Jesus said this, don't miss this. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. All authority has been given to Jesus in this moment on earth and in heaven. In light of him having all authority, go therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all the things that I have commanded and lo, don't forget this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Translation, we are commissioned to reach the nations for Jesus. That includes our nation, church. Making disciples, introducing them to the Savior, living lives as citizens of heaven on earth. Our God is the final say. If he stands for me and he is with me, not worried about anyone or anything that can come against me, this is gospel truth. And since we're not dead, we are charged and commissioned to not be done. And we commit and cast prayers and votes 
in the direction of God, and we leave the outcome to him. Let's pray. Father, so be it, your truth, that it would reign and rule in our hearts first, in our homes, in our land. We trust you for the outcome. We know that you are a sovereign God in complete control. We, we rest in that, but we also have an unrest within us, knowing that something's lurking beneath the surface. And now for such a time as this, you are calling and awakening your church. And this is not about a minister beating a dead horse. This is what you've called me to, to arouse a sleeping lion. So wake us up. Let us stand for truth in the midst of a land of lies. Would Jesus be glorified? So thank you, O oh God, as we sing you praise now. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Amen.